Good afternoon, everyone. If you could please take your, your seats. Um, welcome to the fourth special session of this 15th IISS Shangri-La Dialogue. I'm very pleased to introduce you this afternoon to an exceptionally strong panel of speakers, uh, each of whom will make brief introductory remarks uh, in order to provide a basis for the uh, discussion uh, which will follow. Our distinguished panelists in this session are, uh, first of all, on, on my uh, right uh, here, Tansri Dato, Sri Dr. Zulkifli bin Mohammed Zin, uh, Malaysia's Chief of Defense Force, and then on my immediate uh, right, uh, General Sir Nicholas Houghton, uh, the United Kingdom's Chief of Defense Staff, and on my, my immediate left, Lieutenant General Glorioso Miranda, Acting Chief of Staff, Armed Forces of the Philippines, and on my far left, uh, Nelly LaHood, uh, the IISS Senior Fellow for Political Islam from our Middle East office. Before asking our panelists to make their opening remarks, I'd like to make a few introductory uh, comments of my own. The attack in Jakarta in January this year focused attention on the threat of Islam Islamist uh, terrorism in Southeast Asia. The region, particularly Indonesia, but also Malaysia and the Philippines, has been a source of recruits for the Islamic State in the Middle East. Islamist groups in the region with track records of violence, uh, including the Abu Sayyaf group in the southern Philippines, have affiliated themselves with ISIS. And as the Jakarta attack seemed to show, there is a local threat, not only from returning fighters, but also from jihadis who have been radicalized, uh, but for one reason or another haven't traveled to the Middle East to fight. But there are some big questions around this topic. How serious is the current terrorist threat in the region? How does it compare with the threat from Jamai Zalamiya in the region 10 or 15 years ago? Do we really know how many Southeast Asians have gone to the Middle East to fight? How dangerous really is the threat from returning fighters? And what are regional states' responses? Are they doing everything that might be ideal? in terms of strengthening interagency, whole-of-government approaches to counterterrorism, Are they exchanging enough intelligence and the right type of intelligence among themselves and with external partners such as Australia, the US, and with European and Middle Eastern states? And perhaps most significantly in the context of this session and this dialogue, what is the proper role of the armed forces in counterterrorism? in this region? That's a, that's a long list of questions, but I hope that each of our panelists may be able to comment on at least uh, some of those questions. So I'd like, first of all, um, to turn to uh, Malaysia's Chief of uh, Defense Forces, General Zulkifli. Thank you, General. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tim Husley, the moderator, members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to present my views on the issue of enhancing cooperation against jihadi terrorism in Asia. A recent phenomenon that has afflicted the world is the advent of jihadi terrorism by groups driven by extreme religious ideologies to further their organizational interests and objectives. Jihadi terrorism is a consequence of integrating Islamic ideology with the idea of jihad in a sense that extreme interpretation of Islamic texts contribute to the rise of violent jihad. Among the numerous jihadi terrorist groups in existence today, the Islamic states or Daesh, is the most prominent and dangerous. Daesh boasts of affiliation with 43 other minor terrorist groups globally, where seven of these groups originate from Southeast Asia, such as the Jama'a Islamia and the Abu Sayyaf group. 
despite having a history of engaging religious extremism and radicalization, Malaysia has shown great concern on the development of Daesh. This is evident after a total of about 200 suspected collaborators have been detained by the Malaysian police since 2013. The government has also managed to have foiled a number of attacks planned by this suspected terrorist, including the latest arrest last month in May of 2016. On the same note, the government has identified more than 100 militias fighting in Syria and Iraq under the auspices of the Katibah Nusantara Lidawla Islamia or the Malay Archipelago Battalion of ISIS and which is an ethnically Malay Islamic State unit of which we believe that about 20 Malaysians which are members of this group in Syria have died in the firefight and six of which died as suicide bombers. Ladies and gentlemen, in combating the jihad terrorism threat, the Malaysian Armed Forces has adopted a policy of strong interagency cooperation and pragmatic multilateral collaboration while adopting soft and hard approaches. In this sense, the measures taken are firstly developing strong inter-regional collaboration with the armed forces of ASEAN member states through the exchange of information and building of capacities. The military intelligence exchange between Malaysia and other ASEAN member states and the conduct of the multinational counter-terrorist exercises such as the one that was conducted last year in 2015 involving the militaries and police forces from 11 countries within and beyond ASEAN are good examples. Secondly, Malaysia is a member of the Saudi-led Islamic Military Counter-Terrorism Coalition comprising of about 40 member states. This coalition, with the establishment of a joint military center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, will formulate strategies in countering the threat of Daesh worldwide. These coalitions will focus on the aspect of countering the Daesh ideology, information and media, and finance and to build military cooperation among member states in countering the threat of Daesh. Ladies and gentlemen, in the aspect of the military cooperation of this coalition, the Malaysian Armed Forces involvement is in the areas of military training, exchange of information and intelligence, and the provision of logistics. The third measure that has been taken is that the Malaysian Armed Forces is also cooperating with other government agencies in the country, particularly the Malaysian police as a whole of government approach in the conduct of joint patrols, especially in strategic areas uh, in cities throughout the country, and the conduct of comprehensive border management by collaborating with neighbors such as Indonesia and Thailand to the respective regional border committees. And fourthly, the Malaysian government has also adopted a number of means to project soft power in facing this threat. Primary is the establishment of the Southeast Asia Regional Center for Counter-Terrorism in Kuala Lumpur 
to train, build capacities, research, and increase public awareness on terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, taking a lift out of that initiative, the Malaysian government had also organized the first international conference on de-radicalization and countering violence extremism in January of this year. This gathering of experts from within and beyond ASEAN was aimed to enhance cooperation between security agencies, share and analyze the best practices from the various de-radicalization programs, identify the target groups who are vulnerable to extreme militant ideology, and discuss the role of governments in rehabilitation efforts. Over and above these activities, the Malaysian government, including the Malaysian Armed Forces, in the collaborative effort to negate the influence of jihadi terrorism, is establishing the Digital Counter Messaging Center, which wages a war of ideas through the resourceful lines of persuasion among the various target groups. And other measures taken by the Malaysian government is to promote the practice of moderation, especially in the realm of religion, either domestically, regionally, or globally. The establishment of the Global Movements of Moderates, or the GMM, by the Malaysian Prime Minister is a clear manifestation of Malaysia's role in trying to combat or counter jihadi terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, to date, the measures taken by the Malaysian government have been very effective and successful as we are able to stem the influence of the Daesh in the country. Similarly, I believe that there must be a concerted and comprehensive initiative or effort by all ASEAN member states to detect, trace, and monitor the sources of funding for the Katibah Nusantara from ASEAN member countries. This will be able to isolate the terrorist group and suffocate them from the much needed fund. Similarly, Due to the real and present danger of Daesh, the government has recently introduced the Prevention of Terrorism Act and also the Foreign Fighters Act in order to better empower the enforcement agencies in combating the threat of terrorism. That said, however, ladies and gentlemen, it is undeniable that Daesh will seek more innovative and unconventional means or methods to spread terror in this region. For that, enhancing cooperation is not an option, but a necessity to ensure security, stability, and the preservation of human security. Thank you for your kind attention. General, thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive, yet at the same time uh, succinct uh, survey of the uh, measures being taken by the Malaysian government and, and particularly by um, your armed forces uh, in response to this uh, uh, challenge, uh, this contemporary challenge of uh, jihadi terrorism in, uh, in Malaysia. Um, now I, I'd like to ask uh, the UK's uh, Chief of Defence Staff, Sir Nicholas Halton. Thank you very much, Tim. Can I say how delighted I am to be here? Can I extend my own gratitude as well to our hosts, both to Singapore but also to IISS to, uh, uh, for providing us with this wonderful opportunity? Uh, can I perhaps as a prelim say I do not pretend to be an expert in Southeast Asian counterterrorism? And can I also say that what I have to say is not... Uh, an endorsed national position. Indeed, it is only the product of today's reflections. 
which why if the translation is not too good it's because I don't have a prepared script but the translator has taken a, a photograph of my notes so she may um, be not as precise as she would have hoped. Uh, what I have to say does not deny the requirement that General Zul has outlined for enhanced security and intelligence cooperation, not at all. But if I rush to my conclusions and then work backwards, my three conclusions to leave you with would be that the principal requirements for cooperation are those of establishing a shared understanding and to conduct coordinated action on the non-military aspects of countering terrorism. Secondly, it would be to avoid the potentially dangerous militarization of an ideological problem. And the third would be to definitely not neglect the sovereign views of local partners. I arrive at those um, conclusions through four steps. Firstly, generic threats. Secondly, the nature of terrorism. Thirdly, the specific jihadi threat. And then just some assessment from a British um, North Atlantic view of how we're doing. Um, virtually every seminar such as this on security that you go to, the buzzwords are hybrid, asymmetric, novel, non-conventional. The general conclusions are that the nature of threats today are transnational, transregional, multifunctional. The first thing to comment on from a military perspective is that the established military mechanisms for command and control are not currently appropriate. Military command and control tends towards a regional approach to the military resolution of a problem. And we collectively, and particularly, dare I say, were the chairman of the US Joint Chiefs here, would recognize the shortcomings of the command and control architecture that we currently have. And there is an old British uh, phrase that if all you have is a hammer, you define every problem as a nail. And I think that this is appropriate to some of our approach to the problem of countering terrorism. My second point is that terrorism is not of itself a threat, but is a threat mechanism which undoubtedly has grown in potency. And it is now not just a threat to individuals, but to regional stability, state integrity, domestic security, as well as creating significant side effects, one of which is humanitarian crisis, and the further one is probably the biggest concern, certainly within Europe at the moment, that of mass migration. So I think to label it as simple terrorism in perhaps what we have historically viewed it is to potentially massively understate its potency. Moving specifically to the jihadi threat, ISIS or Daesh, I think as Zul has very carefully outlined, at its heart, it is an ideology that informs a powerful narrative that exists in the virtual world of social media, a battle of both information and perception to an extent magnified by media commentary and the political responses to that commentary. So the principal battleground for this is the virtual world in which an ideology can be battled with and undermined. We tend towards, however, looking at what I would call the three physical manifestations of Daesh or ISIS terrorism. They are the existence of a caliphate, that area of land which covers the borders of both Syria and Iraq. Then a growing number of franchises or affiliates Libya, Nigeria, Somalia, and in Southeast Asia, Zul was just informing me of the Malaysian archipelago. And these are affiliates which exploit fault lines rather than the terrorism being ab initio driven by those fault lines. 
And then the third physical manifestation is the projection of this terrorism into our domestic circumstances, which is the phenomena perhaps that we most fear in much of mainland and continental Europe. My final point then is how are we doing? And I would assess this uh, in four ways, as it seems to me. The firstly is I sense from a UK perspective, we are overly focused on the military dimension of the destruction of the physical caliphate. Uh, why is this? I do think that there is a strong interplay between political statements and the desire for political headlines and political legacies with media demands for statements on progress and the military dimension of this being the most tangible and the most photogenic. The second, I would say, is that we have been to an extent distracted by the need to deal with the symptoms of the threat, of which migration, humanitarian crisis, and domestic terrorism are the three most obvious. Third, I would say, is that we have, and I'm in pleasant constructive friction with my diplomatic colleagues on this, perhaps laid insufficient emphasis on political stability and the routes to achieve it. And political progress, certainly in Iraq and Syria and Libya, lags rather than leads military action, and this is a dangerous sequence. And then fourth, I would say that there is, at the moment, insufficient coherence in that element of the campaign that counters the ideological basis. We have made some progress in closing down some of the access to social media. But in confronting the physical dimension of the threat first, before we have embarked on resolving the ideological basis, we run the risk of establishing the basis of a continuing and more insidious problem. And so it's through that stages of observation and personal reflection I would repeat my own conclusions. that I think amongst the residual, at least, principal requirement for cooperation is the shared understanding and coordinated action on the non-military aspects of countering terrorism. Secondly, the avoidance of the dangerous militarization of what is an ideological problem. And then thirdly, our current tendency to neglect the sovereign views of the local partners who are most closely involved. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Nicholas. Um, I think you've provided an extremely uh, valuable perspective from the, based on the UK's um, experience. And it, it's going to be interesting to see how much resonance that, that has in, in this region. Uh, but I think that's extremely useful. Thank you very much. Um, now, General Miranda. <coughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tim Huxley, the Executive Director for the IISS Asia, distinguished speakers, fellow delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. There is no doubt that the ISIS brand of terrorism is now one of the more serious and pressing security issues of our time. But as serious a threat as the ISIS has become in Iraq and Syria, each spread to Southeast Asia needs to be framed within the conditions of our own peculiar environment. To begin with, Southeast Asia is no stranger to terrorism. Since 1911 attacks in the United States, and even before that, we have experienced a number of our own, from the 2002 bombings in Bali to the 2004 Super Ferry and 2005 mass bombings in the Philippines, just to mention a few. While one may argue that our region is susceptible, three things 
must be borne in mind. First, ISIS and the terrorists in our region are not of the same mold, do not operate under similar conditions, and do not share the same end goals, but rather variety of end states. The JI, in my opinion, is not ISIS, at least not yet. The Abu Sayyaf group is not ISIS, at least not yet. And there is no ISIS affiliate with the capability to large, launch large-scale attacks in our capital. It must be acknowledged, however, that ISIS-inspired groups do exist. Second, precisely because of our shared experience, our governments and communities have already evolved best practices across a range of counter-terrorism efforts, notwithstanding notable differences in our approaches, we are effectively addressing its threats and impact with notable resilience. And third, the socio-political dynamics within our states do not exactly host the same breeding grounds for radicalism to fester and spread each condagion. The reason for those displays of visceral hatred and violence that we often see in the Middle East are hardly visible in our region, given our democratic space, climate of religious tolerance, and all embracing cultures. Having said those, it is important to nonetheless realize that jihadi, ISIS-inspired threat lurks in our midst. Since early 2014, the IS is reported to have made gradual inroads in Southeast Asia, a Malay archipelago unit for the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria was established in Syria in 2014. A language school has been set up in Raqqa purportedly to indoctrinate Southeast Asian fighters in IS, IS ideology. In our region, in the places like Poso, jihadi activity by self-proclaimed I repeat, self-proclaimed militants has been reported along with the presence of Uyghurs in the training camps. Now, over in the Philippines, the specter of ISIS has likewise become our pressing security concern given the propensity of the Abu Sayyaf, or we call ASG. Particularly, the Basilan-based group headed by Isnilon Hapilon to seek IS recognition. On 9 April 2016, the attack of this group on our forces in Basilan resulted in the death of 18 of our troops and 38 on their side, including foreign terrorists, reportedly an IAD expert. On April 25, following the expiration of its deadline for the payment of a ransom, the ASG bandits beheaded Canadian John Richdale in Sulu and released its video online. Our condolences and apologies to the bereaved families. To the uninitiated, the execution may, might appear to have been ISIS inspired. In truth, it was primarily driven by money. Still, the group's aspirations for affiliation cannot be discounted. For the simple that it left unchecked, it could just become an affiliate. The AHG follows a 4A phenomenon. 4A, assimilate, associate, acknowledge, and finally to be accredited. First, they associate and assimilate with the thinking of the IS. Next, they get acknowledged for their terroristic activities then, finally, they are recognized as affiliates and finally accredited. This is, of course, one of the ways how the organization grows aside from the normal belief or, I would say, the normal active recruitment from the ISIS themselves. Now, there were those that... Now, where does that situate us? Against the movement of ISIS-inspired threat, 
it is important that we acknowledge first the need for cooperative convergence against the jihadist terrorism. Exactly where should our cooperation lie? Let me venture only two, which happens to be the right enemies' living spaces. From our security perspective, the first critical area of cooperation lies in the tri-border maritime area encompassing the Sulu Sea and the Sulu Sea. This is an area that is as porous as it is perilous and remains largely ungoverned. Over the years, it has become the preferred nautical highway of national criminals, militants, and terrorists. This is where maritime terrorism occurs. As highlighted this year by the AHG kidnappings, this area needs patrolling and policing, but this cannot be done by one country alone. It calls for regional and national cooperation. Thankfully, the governments of Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines have responded to this call and decided to act. Following the signing in Yogyakarta last 5 May 2016 of the joint declaration between the foreign ministers and chief of defense forces of these respective countries on the immediate measures to address security issues in the maritime areas of concern. The three armed forces now started work on the standard operating procedures for the conduct of trilateral coordinated patrols. On the sidelines of the ADMM in Vientiane last week, the same ministers agreed to step up collaboration, particularly, particularly in joint training. This approach, it must be stressed, is pragmatic and doable and should bode well, not only for our collective counter-terrorist efforts, but also, and not coincidentally, to address all other maritime security issues. The second area of cooperation lies in the social media in the use of information and communications technology, another critical living space. We know now that IS-inspired terrorism feeds on our reactions of shock and fear, and at the same time, on the twisted fascination of other groups to follow suit. And we understand now that their control of media content through which they conduct their cyber jihad. Similar to the ungoverned maritime space, the open sites, the electronic boards, and all the potential cyber sanctuaries in the internet must be painstakingly trolled for terrorist content by all concerned governments, agencies, multinational organizations, administrators, and special units. The ICT, or Information Communications Technology or Organizations in our region, should share advanced software to track emotional inflection points in the world wide web. The sophistication of our cyber technologies should be brought to bear wherever the terrorist might be hiding. The capacities of our agencies for intelligence and surveillance, and even social advocacy must be coordinated to initiate, sustain, or provide dedicated follow-on actions to constantly discredit jihadist claims and all together take out the air from them with no blags made, no column inches given, and no prisoners taken. All this must not only find common lines in policy and strategy, but in cooperative efforts. Last week, the ASEAN Defense Chiefs approved the Philippines-sponsored Cyber Security Working Group under the ASEAN ADMM+. This working group, which will be co-chaired by New Zealand in time for the Philippines' chairmanship of the ASEAN Summit next year, will provide the needed platform for the exchange of expertise and knowledge, as well as promotion of practical cooperation in cybersecurity. Again, this is a step in the right direction 
and it's about time. Initiative like this could lead, among others, to the disruption of jihadist influence, even as its primary goal is to keep our cyber systems secure and resilient. Knowing then how actively engaged we must remain, I say that we must put our hands and ears to the ground and feel the nuances of the pulse of our communi communities so that in the end, no one gets radicalized. However we do it, at the end of the day, the general public must be made aware of the ends of the ISIS-inspired propaganda and be guided at all times to never stay in the middle but stand weight against terrorism. My friends, guests, let us not allow the jihadist or ISIS-inspired to make terror the norm. Let us not allow ourselves either to make the use of counterforce the norm. Instead, let us use the application of our enhanced cooperation, the new normal. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you very much, General Miranda, for that uh, excellent uh, uh, survey of, uh, of Philippine policy and uh, the work of the Philippine Armed Forces and other, other agencies in countering this, this threat. That's uh, a, a very good and useful contribution. Uh, and I think there are a number of points we might come back to later in that. I Thank you. I can react to you, please. Um, if you'd like to, if you'd like to make, if you'd like to interject a, a brief comment now, yes. Uh, just a brief comment with my colleagues here from the United Kingdom. I would say right now, as the acting chief of staff, that indeed the uh, terrorism problem is not entirely a military solution. That right now I can say it, uh, which we are undertaking it in our region. As we speak right now, there are operations going on. And in the same manner that I brief our cluster E security briefing in Malacanang, and I explicitly stated that it's not entirely a military solution. You were right there. Thank you, Thank you very much, General. And uh, our, our final uh, panelist is Nelly Lahoud, uh, the IISS uh, senior expert on political Islamism. And I think Nelly will be able to put the discussion in a, in a broader context. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I'd like to preface my presentation by noting that uh, I do not study closely Southeast Asian jihadism. I don't know the languages, but I do follow uh, the jihadis in the Middle East. I follow their Arabic sources. And so my assessment today or my analysis is really looking at Southeast Asian jihadism through the lens of uh, um, uh, uh, the Middle East and, and Daesh on that side. Um, well, uh, on the good side is that 2015-2016 has, uh, has not been a good year for Daesh. It has lost many of the cities it had captured in Iraq and Syria, and it looks like it is struggling um, in the crowded militant landscape in Libya. At the same time, ISIS managed to mount and inspire several terrorist operations outside the areas it controls. Now, less than two weeks ago, that's the last public statement by ISIS's spokesman, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, and it suggests that ISIS may be facing at least three challenges. The first is that it's losing some key operational leaders by U.S. airstrikes. Second, it is struggling to justify its territorial losses to its supporters. And third, it is unable, it seems, to maintain the momentum of foreign fighters joining its fight. I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A about what he said specifically. So how might ISIS change of fortunes affect jihadism in Southeast Asia? To start with, the number of Southeast Asians who travel to fight alongside ISIS in the Middle East is ranked among the lowest. Further, analysts who track jihadi activities in the region have cautioned against overblowing the jihadi threat, pointing to the incompetence of the enthusiasts who have been arrested by the authorities, and also to the poor training of those who executed attacks and failed to deliver the planners' intended specular effect. 
Yet the same analysts are also worried that the situation may change if some of these ISIS fighters in the Middle East return home or if ISIS directs its supporters to mount attacks in the region to make up for its losses in the Middle East. They also fear that the region may well witness more attacks like those that targeted Jakarta, Central Jakarta, in January, as well as the Philippine security forces in April this year. Now, ISIS would certainly welcome any attack carried out in its name anywhere in the world. Lately, however, ISIS public statement, which I referred to earlier, seems to be stressing the group's desire for its supporters to carry out attacks in Europe and the United States. And Al-Adnani, whom I mentioned, is calling upon European and U.S. jihadis to open the door of jihad specifically in Europe and the U.S. Um, and in, in his words, he says, however minor the operation you carry out in the midst of their abode, in other words, in Europe and the U.S., be sure that it would be better and more important for us than the major operations carried out here, i.e. in Iraq and Syria. But Al-Adnani's statement also suggests that some of ISIS supporters are, and I'm quoting him, refraining themselves from targeting so-called civilians, doubting whether, from an Islamic legal perspective, such attacks would be lawful. So if this restraint continues, and in view of the existing pro-ISIS sentiments among some in Southeast Asia, Al-Adnani may well decide to single out Southeast Asia to rise up to the challenge in his future statements. Now, what is the likely success of ISIS growth in Southeast Asia? So, ISIS does not enjoy a monopoly over Southeast Asia's jihad. Indeed, the landscape is saturated with militant groups. Many of them have taken it upon themselves to discredit the legitimacy of ISIS as a caliphate. But notwithstanding ISIS's limited influence, its supporters have gradually built an ideological capital in the region. Indeed, some Southeast Asian jihadi leaders and ideologues were among the first to pledge allegiance to ISIS's leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And several groups in the Philippines and Indonesia have released videos to publicize their pub pledges, with some of them displaying their guns and showcasing their training camps to, pro to project their um, battlefield credentials. Also, there is an online army uh, uh, in place devoted to translating ISIS publications and promoting the group's worldview. The recent attacks in Indonesia and the Philippines, as well as the numerous foiled plots the past couple of years, reflect the desire of ISIS supporters to translate their ideological commitment into action. Yet ISIS is yet to bestow upon its Southeast Asian supporters the designation of wilaya or province as it has done with others uh, um, uh, elsewhere, like in Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Yemen, and West Africa. I was very interested in General Miranda's um, four A's, which is associate, associate, acknowledge, affiliate, accredit, which is, I, I, might, I might use it elsewhere, but I'm intrigued, why hasn't ISIS um, reciprocated the love of Southeast Asians that have been pledging allegiance to it, and it hasn't really bestowed upon them this, this wilaya? And that's, that's intriguing. Um, what could be holding ISIS back? One possible explanation is that ISIS expectations are yet to be met. As noted earlier, Southeast Asian jihadis make up a very low percentage of ISIS foreign fighter contingency. So ISIS may well deem it scandalous that a region that constitutes about 40% of the world's Muslim population is delivering less foreign fighters than France. If this is a plausible explanation, and if ISIS enthusiasts cannot deliver a respectable number of fighters, they may try to make up for this in terrorist operations, which would be worrying, of course. So ISIS may well be destined to lose its territories in the Middle East, but as it does, the group will likely seek every opportunity to unleash its wrath on the rest of the world. Now that ISIS needs to project an even greater violent global presence to make up for its territorial losses in the eyes of its supporters, it may put in place a reward system in form of a wilaya for its Southeast Asian supporters if they deliver in blood currency. So what could states do in this region? Um, obviously, the other panelists are better placed uh, uh, than me to, uh, uh, to, to comment on these issues, but I'll offer three remarks. I think uh, uh, the one is that, uh, uh, as, as others have noted, 
ISIS really does not enjoy monopoly here in the jihadi landscape, and the other jihadi groups should not be neglected while the focus is on ISIS. Second, as others have commented, um, shared intelligence and cooperation between states is critical. And in fact, it's in this region and beyond. As General Miranda noted, some of the training camps are you know, we're seeing Uyghurs, we're seeing Moroccans, we're seeing transfer of, of uh, 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 fighters from different countries. And in this respect, ISIS, as well as other jihadi groups, are rather uh, cosmopolitan, if you like. They don't differentiate between states. Um, and they're willing to, to cooperate. So, and I think focused intelligence. It's very important, for instance, uh, uh, to look for facilitators. Uh, uh, because facilitators, those, for example, who facilitated the flow of foreign fighters to the Middle East have, have done so uh, remarkably well. Some of them have facilitated over a thousand uh, uh, foreign fighter. And so these, these kind of focused uh, uh, areas of intelligence would, would go a long way. Third, um, I want to comment on this desire to counter the narrative to ISIS. I worry about more narrative. Uh, um, uh, uh, I think political leaders should not compete with terrorist groups on what is religion, and in this case, what is Islam. They should stick to the business of governance, good governance that responds to the needs of its populace, particularly the aspiration of its young people, is ultimately the best CT measure that states can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. I, I think that was uh, extremely useful to... to as you put it, look, look at this issue from, from a, a Middle East perspective. Um, and that uh, was something you said, um, I think raised a, a question that I'd, I'd like to put to um, General Miranda and, and General Zulkifli, and, and, and this relates to this issue of intelligence exchange. Um, I, I'd like to ask you, do, do you think that you are, you are benefiting from the sort of intense exchange of uh, focused intelligence that you would ideally like to have within the region? Are your, are your Southeast Asian partners and your wider international partners um, exchanging intelligence which you find is, is useful? Maybe General Miranda, you could say something on that. Yeah, I did bother elaborating it, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a very intensive coordination as far as intelligence is concerned. There are those, those that we cannot declare, of course, with uh, my partners in the, uh, in the ASEAN and so with the foreign intelligence that uh, we have spoiled a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, threats, so to speak. As you recall, we just hosted the APEC last year and the visit of the Pope, and uh, there were really a real threat into that particular activity worldwide for that matter, but we were able to spoil it. Over and above of this one is that, in as far as the Philippines is concerned, the command structure of the Abu Sayyaf were, were able to reduce to, maybe I would like to quantify at 85%, the remaining 15%, I hope we can finish them before June 30 for the assumption of our new president. Thank you very much. General Zokifli? Well, uh, we have been uh, aggressively engaging uh, other members of the ASEAN uh, Armed Forces, especially in the uh, intelligence uh, aspect uh, on, on Daesh. We realize that uh, intelligence is very important, and um, we have decided to go one step further, not only exchange intelligence bilaterally, but all the ASEAN J2s, the intelligence, uh, military intelligence department, decided to have and sit down all the 10 members of the J2 and discuss about this problem and exchange at a multilateral level. Uh, that is done within ASEAN. Uh, that is a clear manifestation of how serious we are looking at the threat of Daesh. If we do not act now, there will be a possibility of the fighters coming back, returning into this region and start to network with one another 
and will form up something like the Jama'at Islamia and that would create uh, some problems in this region, in the countries, which might affect the economy of that particular country or the region because of the disability that has been created. So uh, we are at the moment happy uh, with the intelligence exchange or the interfax with member countries and we are also going beyond the ASEAN borders to, to get the experiences. We have been having cooperation with many other countries in Europe which is facing the threat of Daesh and also in the Middle East we are doing that and we exchange this with other members of uh, the J2 of ASEAN member states uh, and uh, with our police and so on. So we have done a lot but we are not uh, uh, we've, we wish to do more. We wish to do more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General Zulkifli. We, we now have uh, just over 30 minutes for questions and answers and uh, points from our, our delegates and uh, hopefully some discussion. Um, if, you, if you'd like to make a point or ask a question, if you could please put your name board vertically and uh, I will then... Uh, recognize you once I've made a list of people who would like to ask questions in the first round. Okay. Um, Fleur de Villiers. Bottom right. There we are. Yeah. Thank you. It, it's just a very quick question, and it actually reprises a question that I asked uh, in the plenary this morning, um, but I think... Um, uh, it was perhaps uh, misunderstood. Um, a very senior member of the Singaporean uh, administration said to me the day before yesterday that the greatest fear that they had um, was the imminent threat of terrorism in Singapore. Uh, and he, he said one of the problems that they faced was that although they regularly caught fighters intending to go to the Middle East and then returned them to their home country, the home country did not incarcerate but released them. And uh, the country in question was Indonesia. So if that degree, that suggests that in this, the cooperation, this sort of web of cooperation which you've referred to, um, has pretty large holes in it. Um, to what extent can they be blocked? Uh, thank you very much, Fleur. I, I suspect that's part, that, that part of the answer to that question is the, the difference in legislation between countries in the, in, in the region, but, but we can... Uh, come back to that. Victim, um, that's a symptom, not an answer. Um, Chari, Chari Jokin. To General Zulkifeli, I noticed that you used the term Daesh in your, in your presentation earlier, and I also remember the Malaysian Defense Minister also used the term Daesh instead of what the others had used, such as ISIS, ISIL, or IS. Does this have any significance in your strategy for counterterrorism? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, Shafkat Munir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, at the outset, I would like to compliment all the panelists uh, for their very good presentations. I'm Shafkat Munir from Bangladesh. I have a particular question to Sir Nicholas. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face uh, in our part of the world, South Asia, and there's quite a few South Asians in this room, is we are still trying to fashion a proper process for greater interagency coordination. So I was wondering if the United Kingdom offers any particular lessons which uh, could be useful for Bangladesh and the wider region. And I think I see uh, we're very fortunate to have four out of the five FPDA chiefs of defense staff in this room. So I was also wondering if you could highlight some of the uh, confidence building measures or the CV related conversations that are happening under the rubric of the five power defense agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Shafkat. Uh, Ambassador de Klerk. Um, I would like to thank uh, the panel for for four uh, fascinating presentations. Um, I have a quick comment and a question. The comment is that I don't know anybody who sees um, uh, fighting terrorism as a military problem, but the military component in this case is bigger because of the territory uh, Daesh um, occupies. Um, and I, I feel great concerns among politicians and military about the phase that this kinetic phase is over and the problem hasn't been solved. Uh, the, the, the question is, um, nearly all um, presenters, presenters um, refer to earlier um, terrorist movements in the region. And my question is, um, are there thoughts about the difference between this phase of Daesh or Daesh and earlier um, terrorist movements? Is it their international links? Um, is it the use of social media? Is it their greater cruelty? Or do you see other factors in which this um, phase of fighting terrorism is different from earlier phases? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we'll have two more questions in this, this round, and then I'll, I'll go back to the panel for their, their responses. Um, uh, Prashant. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, my two questions for uh, General Zukifli. Um, first of all, I was wondering um, regarding Malaysia's role in the Saudi coalition uh, that you stated. You mentioned um, there are various ideological and financial initiatives within that. I was wondering if you could be more specific, if you could, about Malaysia's role within the Saudi coalition, um, how we're contributing uh, and the like. Um, and secondly, um, the, Malaysia is also part of the counter ISIL coalition um, with the United States and a number of other countries there. Um, and part of uh, Malaysia's efforts with the United States is the setting up of a counter messaging center um, that I think you mentioned as well. Um, could you maybe update us on what the status of that counter messaging uh, center is and what are some of the opportunities and some of the challenges that Malaysia has encountered when setting this up? Thanks. Mr. Tripathi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Axley. I am Sanjeev Tripathi from India. First of all, I would like to compliment all the panelists for excellent presentation. Uh, what I gather from this presentation that so far the thrust has been on military solution and a lot of success has been achieved through international cooperation, intelligence sharing, etc. But again, I would like to emphasize that as long as the radicalization of Muslim youth continued, the problem is likely to continue with ups and downs on the ground situation. Fighting the problem at ideological level, I will seek the comment of the panelists, is a must for long term solution, both in the cyberspace and on the ground. In cyberspace, there are a number of sites. I mean, one can destroy those sites, but there is hardly any site which counters the arguments given by the jihadis. So progressive Muslims need to be encouraged to have sites which will religiously counter the arguments. Similarly, on the ground, I will say the holy book is the same, but it is the preacher in the mosque or teacher in the madrasa. If he is a radical element, he will interpret it in that manner. And if he is a progressive Islamist, then of course the interpretation will be different. So on the ground as well as in cyberspace, uh, this area needs to be, you know, much more needs to be done in this area. This is uh, what I feel and I will seek your uh, views on that. 
Thank you very much. Well, we have uh, six, six questions there. Um, so maybe I can ask our panelists to respond in reverse order, starting with, with, with Nelly. Thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, regarding the ideological and why is, is uh, ISIS different. Um, on the ideological side, it is different. It wants to build a state. The jihadis before, they want to reject the world order of nation states. They want to, they want to bring down uh, 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 the unjust world order, but they don't want to build one of their own. So if I were to really put it succinctly, uh, uh, if we look at what al-Qaeda wanted to do, it was, it was a, a movement that is idealistic. They were prepared to die for the cause. ISIS wants to kill for the cause. And the difference is important, other than the state. On the practical aspect, it is uh, uh, less sophisticated in terms of carrying out attacks. So they really jump for opportunities and so on. Uh, uh, we saw, for example, in the Indonesia attack, uh, uh, it could have, had they been better trained, they would have taken many more. They could have, they could have caused more, more casualties. You could say the same thing about, about France, the attacks in France. They got to a stadium where thousands of people were there. And it, it, out of six operations, all they got were just under 120, to, uh, 120 people. So the sophistication is, is not there, but that makes them unpredictable and so on. With respect to the ideological battle, I want to go back to to my point earlier, this countering nar narrative, I, I do think it's, it's a problem to keep making more narrative than already is. Um, when far-right groups carry out terrorist operations in the United States or in Europe, we don't see Western countries mobilizing their Christian theologians to teach them about peaceful uh, uh, Christian teachings. Why is it that somehow, and, and I realize there's a great deal of good intention on the part of Western countries in terms of wanting to, to counter uh, the narrative, but I also worry that Muslim majority states are falling for this good intentions by Western countries and non-Muslim countries as if they really need to uh, uh, re-examine what Islam is and, and so on. So that's why I, I don't think that, that having more narrative is helpful. Uh, uh, and, and those who are being mobilized uh, to join jihadi groups, it's, you know, religion is the means towards this, but it is really not the actual cause. These are not people who are eager to start with theological lessons and so on. So that's why I'm a little bit more cautious on the ideological narrative. Thank you, Nelly. Could I ask you one specific question? In, in looking at, in looking at, um, the ideology of um, some of the groups in, in Southeast Asia, it's apparent that a, an end of time narrative is, is quite important. How, how important is, is that in the overall ideology of uh, the Islamic State in the Middle East? Um, it's there tangential, tangentially, but not really that, that, uh, 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 that strong in terms of, I mean, you know, the, the title Babak is, is obviously has this apocalyptic aspect. Mm. But in the statements of its leaders, they've not really focused as much on this. I know that it is part of what, uh, 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 what people here join the fight, but that's not the only thing. I think, the real issue at the beginning, why people flooded this, is that I think Daesh's success was its success at the beginning. So if you want to think about it in terms of if religion was their motivating factor, uh, um, you know, they would, be, um, they would be forgiven if they thought initially that God was fighting on their side because they were the incompetence of their enemies and of their adversaries was so shocking that they were winning. I mean, the fall of Mosul and, and, and other cities. So uh, it seemed as if they were unstoppable. And so, yes, God was writing on their side. But now it seems that God may have changed his mind. So for those who have actually joined the fight along these lines, if this is the demographic, then maybe they are reconsidering this. And this is actually evident in, in um, Al-Adnani's last statement because it seems that they are struggling with foreign fighters at the moment. General Miranda. Well, uh, I can only speak in the context of, uh, uh, of our region, and I have to be specify uh, 
specifically in uh, southern Mindanao? Well, indeed, indeed, jihadis or jihad is not new to us. And as far as my personal recollection is concerned, of which I was involved, this has been declared in year 2000 during the offensive. And indeed, uh, in all the aspects, in all the corners, as we do the offensive, jihad has been declared, and they shouted it uh, from every corner. And at the end of the day, it did not, it failed to gain any support or ground. So, and therefore, I would say that jihad has no place in as far as the context of Philippine terrorism is concerned. Now, uh, respective to their, uh, to their, uh, I would say, uh, persistence of having themselves affiliated or accredited with ISIS, I do believe that this is a move or uh, desperate move on their part. Because as you can see, they are waning in one way or the other, and so uh, they would like to get other support or associate themselves, have it accredited for a more internationally recognized, so to speak, organizations, one of which we are speaking right now, the ISIS or the DASH, no matter how you call it. Now, if, my, if I may go back to the military solution, uh, definitely I am saying, while indeed the best cards that we have right now is the military in as far as Philippines is concerned, but we, believe, we do believe, and I do believe, that it's not entirely a military solution. We are combating here the society. We need to reestablish or strengthen our governance. It is an interagency, so to speak. At least at this point, I can only speak, I can only speak within the context of our local environment. So with this, uh, I would like to urge other countries to support us in this particular thing. It is the development of the society. They are the host. The, Al the, the Abu Sayyaf are the virus. We eliminate the host. We educate the host. And so, and therefore, the virus will not thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Sir Nicholas. Thanks. Not, um, not all of the questions were sort of pertinent to me. I think, just on Fleur's question, even though it wasn't particularly direct to me, I mean, I'm rather agree with Tim. I mean, you described it as um, a symptom, but it's a fact. Domestic law differentiates in countries, as does it in the United Kingdom, and the differentiation of what is a threshold of evidence for legal proceedings and incarceration is quite difficult, and it's got us into plenty of trouble with many of our Arab friends. So I do actually think that that is, it is a problem, and I'm not certain how you bring around a sort of an international standard of domestic law for the purpose of treating returned terrorists. So I think it, it, it's perhaps a bigger challenge than you, you might have indicated. Just a, a UK perspective on the term DASH, in actual fact I've used both DASH and ISIS and what I've said. From a UK perspective, the government position now is to use DASH. And even though, and I understand and I'm not an Arabist, even though the formal translation is Islamic State, the nature of the word dash comes with a, a sort of an overtone of, John help me out, of, of sort of, you know, something that's downtrodden. And so there is an element of the counter narrative, if you like, that dash is a more pejorative term. And that's, I think, now why the British government has been, and I don't know whether Zul will comment from him, himself. The, the, the process for greater interagency coordination, I agree. I think perhaps there's more that we can. Um, we can sort of pass out on this. I certainly think that within the counter-information, counter-finance, the seamless nature of intelligence from our overseas intelligence agency to our domestic um, and the, the sort of the joint, the, the sharing of that is now a far more refined process. The degree to which it's refined internationally is still a work in, in, in progress because there are different levels of competence. But I think that certainly within Europe there is a, a very advanced um, desire to bring the professionalization of sharing intelligence to a very much better and more refined level. You, you mentioned the FBDA. I mean, the FBDA clearly it's not a military alliance. It's an arrangement. It is not, it doesn't touch at all on the issue of countering radicalization or extremism. It is more in the, if you like, if it leans into anything, it's more a collective desire to, uh, for mutual and collective security and the support of the international rules-based order. But it, no part of its agenda sort of extends into this particular area. 
Um, the phase that Dash is in and what's different, um, I do think in terms of phases, it's turning now into more of a pure terrorist than a conventional phase. I think actually, as was indicated, the physical caliphate is being destroyed. It's lost 40% of its territory. I would agree with the fact that it's therefore losing some of its irresistible appeal because this sense of irresistible momentum is being reversed. But if you now look at some of the, the, the techniques it's using most recently, dare I say, within Baghdad, the delivery of uh, vehicle-borne IEDs to terrorize a population, uh, it's more now into a terrorist rather than conventional phase, and I sense that that will continue. I don't see the long-term survival of the caliphate because of undermining its economy, undermining elements of its message. Um, and I think that the physical grinding of that bit through conventional military means will ensue. Um, and then the final one, yeah, counter-messaging, well, I would just absolutely agree with that. I, I, I do find myself, although I've seen lots of nodding heads, so I shall have to, because the business about indulging in a counter-narrative, now, I don't necessarily say this is something that sort of UK government should do, other than in that element of the counter-narrative, if you like, is domestically delegitimizing some of our domestic population. That's part and parcel of our government strategy. But to deny the fact that there is an ideological dimension to Daesh, I think flies in the face of most of the mainstream thinking. But, you're probably, but I would buy into the point that things like the physical destruction of the caliphate undermines it and certainly undermines the attraction of it from a recruiting perspective. But I would still go back to my point that we need to separate out the declining potency of Daesh from the irreconcilable nature of some of the underlying problems, part of which is ideological and part of which, frankly, is political. Because if you actually look at um, Iraq, Libya, Syria, even once Daesh has gone, the underlying political state of those countries is so fractured that that is a more significant, potentially long-term problem. Thank you very much. General Sokifli. Thank you very much. Uh, Sunni, thank you for answering. Uh, but I would like to add up. Uh, uh, we, we, we take a position of using Daesh rather than ISIS or ISIL. But basically, Daesh, Daesh is in Arabic, which means Al-Dala al-Islamia fil al Arab al-Sham. So the acronym is Daesh. And it just so happened that Daesh is a word in Arabic, which means uh, a group of bad people, bad people who would like to impose their will on others. So there is Daesh. And on the FPDA, we have transcend uh, in two, because we realize that terrorism is a threat. Uh, we are now uh, embarking on exercises, uh, training on counter-terrorism among the FPDA members. Uh, the mission role in the uh, Islamic military counter-terrorism coalition is uh, our role, we, 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 we realize that we'll be able to benefit from this coalition uh, in terms of uh, uh, one is uh, the counter narrative. You see, in order to provide the counter narrative on the narrative of the Daesh, there is no better country or except than the Muslim countries which get together under this coalition and to counter all the narratives, all the uh, missed uh, representation of the Islamic text. Uh, we, it is under this coalition that we will be able to get the Muslim country member states to get together and we are we are the 
the the the the I would say the authority to do that, and we must package it up as such that it will attract the younger generations. And of course, the, why we are in there is that we will be able to share the experience and the knowledge that and the information and that, that and the intelligence that we get from this part of the world. Because I personally think that. Uh, you know, with the existence of the Katiba Nusantara, probably in the ISIS or Daesh grand strategy is probably to establish a sub-caliphate within this region, comprising of Southern Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Brunei, Malaysia, and Southern Thailand. I wouldn't know. Singapore will be right in the center. And just imagine for a small state, if we have got this threat, what it will do to the prospect of the economy of that particular country. Foreign direct investment will not come in unless uh, this is clearly uh, no longer a threat. So these are the things that we are very concerned of, you know the establishment of the Jama'a Islamiyah has yes, uh, caused quite a substantial problem uh, within this region. Well, we, we work with other countries too as far as, the, you know, in Europe, with France, with the U.S. on counter-terrorism. It's just basically sharing of experience, information, and, uh, and, and causes of actions to be taken. Uh, the counter messaging center is being established. Uh, we are now uh, looking at a few other counter messaging centers that has been established in this world, and, and uh, we would like to replicate that in Malaysia to cover this region. And on the madrasa or pesatren and so on. Yes, it is acknowledged that this was discussed under the coalition. You see, in African, uh, Muslim African states, there are a lot of madrasa that that does not come under the purview of the government. Uh, it is privately uh, run and financed, and it is subjected to uh, extremist uh, religious teaching. So what we have done is that in Malaysia, we have taken over this uh, madrasa under the government where the government will provide better scholarships and start to teach uh, academic uh, subjects which will be relevant for them beside their religious teaching so that they can progress and find a career in the future. You know, if you have a, a madrasa with 100 uh, students and it is all uh, religious teaching, you will not be able to get jobs. Not, you know, I, my country does not have, does not need uh, 1,000 imams or, 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 or uh, in a year. So we have got to, to look into this. And under this coalition, one of the things that we share experience and there will be countries who is willing to provide support and aids in order to bring this madrasa under the government control where it can be regulated, where it can be ensured, assured that the proper Islamic teaching can be done. So those are the benefits, the few uh, benefits, there are many more benefits uh, of, of this, but this what I would like to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General. Um, now, I know Nelly would like to come, come back uh, and uh, join in the discussion again. Oh, can I? Yes, of course. Oh, thank you. I do want to um, uh, uh, address one point. I was not trying to suggest that ideology does not matter. That's what I do for a living, so my, my job is also at stake here. Um, but I do think it's very important to understand how ideology matters, why it matters, 
and very importantly, when it does not matter. Uh, 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 and I think uh, in this respect, this is, this is very important. So when we are talking about violent radicalism, uh, uh, sometimes the idea of having theologians uh, enlisting them in, in that debate, this may not necessarily be helpful. It, it, based on my general readings of ideological text and, and so on, um, I've come to the conclusion that, that uh, many jihadis, and I'm not talking about the ideologues here, but I'm talking about, about the lower level jihadis, um, they, they uh, join uh, jihad not because they want to become better Muslims, but they become better Muslims because they want, or they become more Muslims because they want to join jihad. So really, it's the adventure here that is more important rather than than the religion. Um, uh, uh, I've been told that the anti-smoking campaign in the 60s did not come across when was not successful until the anti-smoking campaign began giving young people the opportunity to be radical. If you were to ask me what is most productive for countering the jihadi narrative, I think more radicalism is probably more productive so long as this radicalism is not violent. So uh, uh, let's give the young the space to be radical without being violent, and maybe they will turn away from religion and other and other matters, uh, um, and away away from from that from Daesh and other groups. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. Um, well, we've had a good discussion. I'm afraid that we're only a few minutes away from our, our time limit now, so uh, I'm going to take the executive decision um, that, that we'll need to close this session soon, I'm afraid, without the, the second round of questions. I, I, and I'm, I apologize to those who would have liked to have made points or, or asked questions, but we really don't have time to give everyone a proper go and then to have more responses uh, from the panel. But I'd like to ask our panelists, it, 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 are, there, are there any of you uh, three gentlemen who'd like to, like to um, have the last word or the penultimate word? Why don't we all give away our time to Mr. Sabah to make his comment from the Middle East? Yes, please. Yes. Of what? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of quotes on um, what went on. Um, it's, it's not a big argument. Islam uh, is 1,437 years old. Um, Islam did not burn people, did not throw people uh, off buildings, did not go to uh, Aleppo, did not go to Palmyra, did not go to, uh, to Babylon, and destroyed the ruins that were there. Uh, very simple and very easy. If the scholars didn't say it, the scholars don't need to say it. What people need to see is what the Prophet Muhammad and all the Khalifites that came after that. So we started, or let's end at the very end uh, of the uh, Turkish uh, uh, or Ottoman uh, Khalifate, they didn't, they didn't destroy uh, Palmyra, they didn't destroy ruins, they didn't burn people, they didn't, 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 because Islam didn't. So let's please not link Daesh to Islam. I beg you, do not go back to history. Look at what history in Islam is doing. They did not burn, they did not kill the way Daesh is killing. They did not ruin and they did not destroy buildings like Daesh did. This is one, one point. Second point I'd like to make is, um, Dr. Lahoud, you were absolutely right. Why did they or why did the spokesman for, for Daesh, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, say that we're losing people? It's because this message is getting there. That the Prophet did not do that. That the Khalifas after him did not do that. That's the trigger. That's what they're, they're hearing. That's what they're listening to. Um, and just a small quote on what you said about the, uh, why isn't there a wilaya in Asia? Um, wilaya needs money, number one. Wilaya needs a different space where in that country people are fighting each other. Uh, it's not happening here in Asia. Wilaya needs an Arabic speaking person. Very simple. One quote I would, I would just ask, and probably uh, uh, Sir Nicholas would, would take it back and, and answer you, and, and I'll let you think about, about this. Why 
is it that Daesh was not uh, attacked in their money business, oil? Not in Raqqa, not in, in Iraq. The oil installations were not hit. That's why they were spending money. They were able to buy people, they were able to buy wilayas outside of Iraq and Syria. BG was not hit until last year, after the Paris attacks. Why? Militarily, why? Why didn't you hit Daesh in BG? Why was it three days after Paris attacks? Thank you, sir, for mentioning that, the importance of not to neglect your partners and your friends and allies who are closer to the region. Thank you again, General, for yielding your time for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a very, very uh, good note on which to end this, this session. Thank you all very much uh, for participating, and thank you most of all to our, our four panelists.